All right. So welcome to the first session of Variations of the Great Refusal. My computer is freezing. Um, Variations of the Great Refusal inst instructed by Cecile Malaspina, who um, is the author of an epistemology of noise and principal translator of Lobert Simidon's Simonden's on the mode of existence of, of technical objects, the collaboration with John Rogo of the University of Minnesota Press in 2017. She's the director of the program at the Collège International de Philosophie Paris, where she's also a member of the ex executive board. She's visiting fellow, a visiting fellow at King's College London, where her program for the SIF is hosted by the Departments of Digital Humanities at, in the Department of the French, the association with the Center of Art and for Art and Philosophy. She's a member of the editorial boards of the SIF's book series at the Press of the Paris Nanterre and of its Journal of Philosophy, Rue Descartes, where she has recently become co-responsible for the epistemology section, as well as being contributing editor for Angela Angelaki, Journal of the Theoretical Humanities. Commissioning editor for the independent publisher Copy Press and guest editor of Nature, Humanities, and Social Sciences, Cecile Malaspina obtained her doctorate in epistemology, philosophy, and history of the sciences and technology from Paris, set seven um, Denis Diderot, and her master's in contemporary French philosophy and critical theory from the Center for Research in Modern European Philosophy in the UK. Sorry. Um, before turning to philosophy, she trained as an artist, art historian, and curator. And her main interest lies in the normativity of concepts, especially with regard to the aesthetic and ethical implications of conceptualizing contingency and uncertainty. So my Wi Fi is weird. Um, all right. So, this in this session um, seminar, we will put our finger on the pulse of the crepuscular prep aesthetics of our times. What are the vital stats of our imaginative powers of consistation? 2021. How do disenchantment and despair feed into contemporary variations of the theme of the great refusal? How does the speculative dimension of aesthetics coexist with the erosion of the natural and cultural commons, the crisis of mass migration in the context of climate chaos, or the feedback of vaccine inequity in the ongoing pandemic? In this historical conjunction marking our generation of creatives, two alternatives present themselves to obsession with GDP growth and blind faith in technological solutions to the ecological crisis. On the one hand, we are confronted with apocalyptic aesthetics of an Anthropocene, shearing the world into the options of doom and rebirth. On the other hand, we see an escapist projection of imagination onto a post-human future. However, transversing these great tendencies and renewing the idea of the great refusal in unexpected ways is a speculative vein in the aesthetics of philosophy. In this seminar, we will investigate the contradictory destinies, destiny of this expression, the great refusal, as punctuated by Dante Alighieri, Herbert Marcuse, and Alfred North Whitehead. As one, denotating the abdication ab ab of responsibility before the events that la life lays at our feet, those who refuse to step up, who are suspended in time, neither alive nor dead, in the antechamber of Dante's hell. Two, a second sense, which implies the opposite of Dante's contempt for the cowardly refusal to step up, the great refusal of all forms of oppression and domination, animating all revolutionary and emancipatory movements, Marquise. And three, lastly, there is the more subtle notion of the great refusal on Alfred North Whitehead in, in, oh, in science and the modern world. Whitehead revives the poignancy of Dante's expression, the, the great refusal, but he directs the sting of its combination at the full breadth of its metaphysical reach. And at stake are not only the events from which we cannot step back without becoming shadows of ourselves, what has use of Dante's expression, the great views or refers to the denial of a vital truth, the vital truth that must be rescued from reductive relation to the alternatives, which whether or not they're cognizized by us. But its defense of this vital truth opens up the question of selective aesthetics, contemporary artistic and curatorial practice. How do artists hold out against the great refusal of a vital truth. In what ways do curatorial practices open up a space for vital truth to manifest in con contravention of reductive discourse? The seminar aims to restore the complexity 
tended to the idea of the great refusal and artistic and pictorial practices. It will engage in the idea of the great refusal as a field of tension and constatation in which speculative aesthetics and great and reason inter intersect. At stake is the capacity of art and philosophy to outwit the pathologies of the great refusal. And then indeed, the crepuscular aesthetics of our generation has a melancholic relation with the emancipatory verb of earlier historical instances of the great refusal. We must not forget that its ambivalence is compounded by the motley reclamations of today's culture wars, the clamor of anti-white, anti-male discrimination, decrying gender and eco-terror in the name of the idealized liberal economy, along with the right-wing activists, activists accusing public policy and pandemic health measures as fascist infringements on individual liberty. These contradynamics of the culture wars must be factored into the complex conjunction we are traversing, that of refusal and counter-refusal. Right, that's all. Uh, now, yeah, now we can start and um, yeah. yeah, we can start. Yeah, that, thank you very much for the introduction. I really appreciate it. And also thank you everyone for being here on a Saturday. I know that it's, it's different times around the world. It's kind of a, a really thrilling to have a conversation with people literally, you know, on, on so distant far-flung corners of the world. And I really appreciate that you make time for me on a Saturday, it's, it's kind of special. I'm going to skip my introduction, which is quite similar to what uh, Nadia just read out. And we can come back to it and we can discuss it a little bit more. Um, and I'm not really into giving long lectures and, and reading stuff, but I think it might be nice to read a chunk and then discuss a bit and then read a little bit more later and, and kind of do, do this kind of progressive thinking together. And as we do this, it might also be nice that whoever kind of chips in, if, you, if you're happy with it, um, we can kind of hijack this and continue the introductions because it's very important for me to think of this more like a dialogue and thinking together rather than kind of content delivery and passive audience. Abandon all hope, you who enter here. These are the words inscribed in dark color over the portal leading into the antechamber to hell in Dante's Divine Comedy. I quote, the sighs, groans, and laments at first were so loud, resounding through the starless air, I began to weep, cries Dante, asking his guide, Virgil, what is this noise I hear? And to this, Virgil replies, this is the sorrowful state of souls unsure. Those lives earned neither honor nor bad fame, and they are mingled with angels, who, neither rebellious to God nor faithful to him, chose neither side but kept themselves apart. Now heaven expels them not to mar its splendor, and hell rejects them, lest the wicked of heart take glory over them. This is in the third canto, the third song of um, the, the hell, or the divine comedy is structured by songs. So hurrying after a whirling banner of conformity, I'm describing here the, this scene in the, in the third canto, hurrying after a whirling banner of conformity, they form what Dante calls a train of souls, so long that I would not have thought death had undone so many. So I'm kind of, you can compare it perhaps to the idea of a silent majority of an kind of oceanic, sense of people who belong to this antechamber of hell, the people who've never you know, stepped up, never spoken up, um, the cowards, in other words. So it is among this dreary guild, repellent both to God and his enemies, that Dante, and this is the famous quote in which we'll, we, we encounter this now famous expression, the great refusal in which Dante, and I quote, saw and recognized the shadow of the coward who made the great refusal. Obviously the poetry is impossible to translate. And, um, and this one is particularly relevant, but I'll, I'll quickly read the Italian version just in case someone understands Italian or maybe if we wanna come back to the work with this, the words that are involved here. Because cowardness, cowardliness is not really a perfect translation for this. 
So Dante says, Vidi e conobbi l'ombra di colui che fece per viltade il gran rifiuto. So that's verse 50 in uh, the third canto in the translation that I have. Sorry, Cecil, what, what would be the, the, the word for coward? Cow, the translation for coward, what would, what would be the original word? In so the word, the Italian word that Dante uses is viltade. It's in a kind of old fashioned word. And um, in French, you can, there's a word that corresponds a little bit to it, which is vilain. But um, you have another word in Italian for cowardice. And cowardice is, is more like the opposite of courage. Whereas viltade to me seems, I'm, I mean, I'm not an Italian translator, but it seems to me a word that implies more um, uh, a baseness, a lack of valor rather than a lack of courage, a lack of, of, of value and conviction and um, audacity. So there's a, there's a whole facet of nuances in, in this word viltad, which, which is um, contemptful, not in the same way that, for example, someone is cowardly if they don't dare to um, jump from a tower in a swimming pool, <laughs> like something could like you, could you Could you type it in the chat? Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Thank you. No, wait, this question and answer. Where, where is the chat here? You might have to go to view up on top, your view menu. Mm, close, manage participants, show chat. Right, thank you. Okay. Viltade. So he saw and recognized the shadow of the coward who made the great refusal. And there's, there's a few things that we'll unpack later here, but um, we don't know who the person is that he's referring to. He's choosing not to explain who this person is or who the, who the shadow is. The shadow is, could also mean the soul of the person who's stuck in the antechamber of hell. Cecile? Yeah. Um, did you want to put your PowerPoint up or is, did you want, is that for later? Do I want to put my what? Your PowerPoint up, or is that for later? Oh, we can. You know what we'll do. Actually, I think at this point it's nicer to have um, to have the the actual canto up. So I'll share my screen. Yes. Okay. So here you can see. Um, I'm. I have a really silly program that once you highlight things, you can't unhighlight it anymore. So you're going to kind of see my own thought process involved in here. So it's on the next line here, you see him entering, um, entering the antechamber to hell. So he's not in hell yet. And, and that's kind of significant that the people who are stuck here are not worthy of heaven, but also you don't want to have them in hell because you don't want people who are in hell to be proud of their bad deeds because at least they weren't, um, they weren't cowardly in the sense of, of the viltade that they had conviction, even though they, they committed a crime and they did it probably with conviction and you don't want them to be proud of it. So where is this? And can you see the verse 50 here at the bottom on the left? I recognize when more than one I recognize had passed, I beheld the shade of him who made the great refusal impelled by cowardice. So at once I understood beyond all doubt that this was the dreary guild repellent both to God and his enemies. So il gran rifiuto, this expression, the great refusal, renders a figure whose refusal is great only in its deficiency of valor. So it's not great like the great horrible deeds of people who go to hell. It's not great like a hero who goes to heaven. It's great in its deficiency of valor. The one who made the great refusal is condemned to oblivion, as is the act of refusal itself. And I quote, to all memory of them, the world is deaf. This is verse 43. Interpreters have nevertheless thought, sought to associate the shadow of the great refusal with a historical figure. And many identified Pope Celestine V, a Benedictine, a Benedictine hermit monk who was elected Pope in 1294, in 1294, and who served for only five months before abdicating. Now to understand why he would figure here as the shadow of the great refusal, it's worth explaining that um, 
he was convinced the, the story says the story goes that um, as he was elected pope at night uh, he heard voices suggesting that there were angels telling him to abdicate because he was not made for power because he's a hermit he's a monk he's someone who should meditate and live in simplicity and not be a man of power and the cardinal accused of having kind of whispered this suggestion into his ear or, or having pretended to be an angel, you know, convincing him that he was not made to be a pope. So the cardinal accused of having pressured Celestine to abdicate was Benedetto Caetani. And he was sure enough, the one who succeeded them and became Pope Boniface VIII. So I'm not gonna be very long with this historical detail, but I, I think it's kind of relevant. So many commentators see in Celestine's abdication the enabling of the power grab of Boniface, because Boniface was the, power, was the Pope who then really transformed um, the power of the church into something that, that was overbearing on, in a way that it hadn't been previously on earthly powers. So Boniface subsequently aided the victory of the black over the white Guelphs. So these were kind of warring factions and Dante belonged to the faction of the Guelphs, who initially had fought for the Pope against uh, the power of uh, the earthly power of the Emperor. He had first defended papal power against the Ghibellines, who were the ones who sided with the Emperor. But later, after the power grab of, um, of Pope um, Boniface, he sided with the white Guelphs against the black Guelphs. So the Guelphs split in defense of the autonomy of secular power from papal overreach. And in this wrangle, Pope Boniface summoned Dante to come to Rome. And while he was in Rome and couldn't fight in Florence, in his hometown of Florence, he, the Pope enabled the Black Welfs to expropriate and exile him. And in fact, um, he was expropriated and he was allowed to return to his city only if he paid a fine for the offense that he'd caused, but he couldn't pay it anymore because he had been expropriated. So this is a really, this is a moment of great tragedy in, um, in Dante's life, a tragic turn of events that may indeed um, seem a plausible reason to seek in the meek hermit at the shadow of the one who commits the great refusal. So the historical consequences and the existential consequences for Dante of the meekness of this Pope are enough probably to place him in the antechamber to hell. However, there is one figure that Dante directly ascribes the invective of Vilta or Viltade to. The only figure other than the shadow in the vestibule to hell who remains purposefully unidentified. And this figure is none other than himself. Now, this takes place in the first canto where Dante, did, where Dante leads um, the reader onto the journey his own journey that will take him through um, hell and heaven with a universally relatable acknowledgement of our fallibility. Let's go to the first canto. Maybe there's a quicker way of, of flicking through these. Here's the first canto. And the first line of which is, is I think, an, a really universally touching reflection of the moment in his life that he finds himself in. If you think of it, I mean, to a certain extent, perhaps autobiographically, that he's lost absolutely everything and he's standing with trepidation before the writing of this great literary work in which he's about to send all the most powerful people of his time literally to hell. So this first line is, midway on our life's journey, I found myself in dark woods, the right road lost. Dante's path out of the thicket and towards the hill crest in this first canto is blocked by three allegorical figures, the leopard, the lion, and a haggard wolf that traditionally stand for the vices of desire, pride and avarice. But to us as contemporary readers, the wolf may well read as an allegory, as an allegory of depression. Let me see, where is the line 35? 
Here we are. If you go to line 35 here. Yeah. Um, got the wrong line, I think I'm, it's somewhere here. Then a grim she-wolf put such heaviness into my spirit. I lost hope of the crest. Like someone eager to win, who tested by loss, surrenders to gloom and weeps. So did that beast force me back toward where the sun is lost. 45, where is that? Oh yeah, you see that here, no? And this is when the ghost of Virgil, roughly, huh? this, I'm summarizing a bit. This is when the ghost of Virgil appears to Dante as an inspiration, offering to guide him on a journey through hell and heaven. However, as soon as the second canto, Dante is overcome. So Dante agrees and he's, uh, his spirits are lifted. He wants to go with Virgil on this journey. But as soon as the second canto, Dante is overcome by self-doubt. A nullifying unease, he calls it, a nullifying unease, now voids his undertaking. I quote, like one who unchooses his own choice. Like one who unchooses his own choice and thinking again, undoes what he has started, end of quote. So he asks himself, who am I to undertake this journey? And he says, I quote, I am no Aeneas, no Paul, not I, no others, no others think me of such worth, and therefore I have my fears of playing the fool to embark on such a venture. So this is the canto, the second canto, verse 25. Okay, but I, what cause, whose favor could send me forth on such a voyage? I am no Aeneas or Paul, nor I, nor others think me of such worth. And therefore I have my fears of playing the fool to embark on such a venture. Virgil encourages him, seeing in Dante a soul offended by an illusion as common as mistaking a shadow for a beast. And that so easily, he says, twists a man away from the noblest enterprise. And he says, I don't know why I wrote it only in, in Italian here, l'anima tua e da viltà de offesa. So this is where you have this other reference to viltà that we find again with the shadow. Where is this? Which line is this? Verse 37. Tower describes your spirit, which can twist a man away from the noblest enterprise as a trick of vision startles a shying beast. Where is the one with the Viltad? I must have I must have gotten the verse number wrong here. Can anyone of you see it on that page? Anyway, it's there somewhere. I, I guess uh, that Viltad is the original so. one, right? The, the translation is discovered this right so it's, it's the, this verse yeah 45 you know what's confusing is that in the english and the italian uh, the verses have different numbers it could be 45 it doesn't matter so your soul your soul is by cowardice offended or how, how would you translate i think actually it would be really nice to find this again i'm sorry for having so if I have here 3745, so it should be one of these. Cowardice grips your spirit. Ah, yeah, no, that's the one. Cowardice grips your spirit because um, I, I find this translation so inadequate. I did, literally didn't recognize it here. L'anima tua è da viltà de offesa. So your, your soul is offended. I think that's a really beautiful expression. And, and it's a real pity to lose that in, in translation. Your soul is offended somehow by this viltad, by this lack of decisiveness, lack of audacity. So how do you translate this without reducing the, this notion of viltad that will then, you know, we find again with the shadow in, in the antechamber to hell. Your soul is offended by a moment of childish fear, by its sinking heart, and once more, after Virgil has beseeched Dante with the help of Beatrice to regain his spirits, 
Virgil asks Dante, why, why stay? Why is your heart by so much cowardice swayed? Where is your ardor and your candor? And in Italian, this sounds a little bit different. Perché, perché restai, perché tanta viltà nel cuore allette, perché ardire e franchezza non hai? So why, why is your heart swayed by so much cowardice? Where is your ardor? Where is your candor? We can now imagine that upon entering the antechamber to hell, Dante recognizes the spirit of the great refusal, which may well be a vision of the shadow of himself that he may have become had he been cowed by depression or self-doubt rather than embark on this journey with Virgil. The condemnation of the opportunists and conformists rings loud in Dante's antechamber to hell. But the viltad of the great refusal also touches upon a vulnerability in all of us. One that Virgil, remar as Virgil remarks in the second canto, deflects so many a valorous undertaking. The viltad of the shadow in the, of the great refusal then is not a vice, strictly speaking, so that you would go to hell for it, nor exactly cowardice. It's more something like an excessive humility. Who am I to? But this excessive humility here is revealed as a false virtue. So it's not a vice, but it also definitely isn't a virtue. Because it's the viltade that feeds the wolf, this beast, the cause of your complaint. I quote the cause of your complaint. The one that forces many an undertaking spirit back to where the sun is lost. So I, I might have something interesting to say. Yeah, uh, cool. because I have a, a Portuguese translation here, and the word I think that he, he the, the translation put is uh, tibieza. That's a really strange word that, like in a in a in a dictionary that I have here, uh, it shows English words like lukewarmness, yeah, or tepid or tepidness. Ah, uh, that's brilliant. Tepidness. Yeah, so like uh, uh, that's really. In Portuguese, it's a really strange word like tibio. The, the quality of being tibio is a really strange word. For I, me. I think that's in, that's incredibly helpful. The the other word I found is one that I'm not, I haven't used myself. So I'm not so familiar with it. Is pusillanimity? I think it's also it's also a small mindedness, but it's it's both a lack of vigor, a lack of conviction, a lack. It's it's not exactly the same as cowardice because it's it's opposite is not. Courage. I think the opposite yeah. of of this tibieza or or viltade is more like yeah, to be valorous. Blackness in another dictionary. Blackness. Ah, like, very good. No, this is so helpful. Like, and and half heartedness. Half heartedness. Ah, that's great. Thank you. And maybe sorry, just saying something about the translation by uh, that Alexander has. But tibiesa, or the you know this uh, thing that it's not warm or cold, is has a very biblical sense. You know, like God hates or God, God vomits the, the people who has tibiesa. I mean, um, I, it's somewhere in the Bible. Sorry, but it's a very common phrase when you're in a in a Catholic school. Oh, if you could find that for me for the next session and, and help me to look that up. That's so incredibly helpful because I, I looked it up in different ways, also with French and I couldn't really, um, in French you have lash and lash is still a bit too close to, uh, to coward, but it already has more of an implication of this kind of lukewarmness of not really knowing. And then you can understand in the antechamber of hell, this kind of oceanic view of you know, an infinite number of people who prefer to stay in the silent majority, who, have, who are this kind of, you know, they, they don't really do something wrong, but they don't really want to step up and do the right thing. And the consequences of that are, are great. So the great refusal is great, not, not because the deed is great or, or because the conviction or anything like that, but it's great both in its abyssal lack of valor and, and vitality and and conviction, but also great in the consequences that this lack of conviction has, the historical consequences, as in the case of this Pope who abdicated and therefore precipitated a, the power grab of the church. And of, of course, also the tragic unfolding of Dante's own life. That's so helpful. Thank you very much. Yeah, please 
if you can look up the find this reference in the bible for me for next time that might also help me to cross reference the translations uh, with english i'm a little bit confused here with the translation because i wasn't happy with pinsky's translation i used that version because it's got the italian text next to it whereas the others don't um, but i've kind of always changed the course yeah, a little sure bit this, this english english translation can can put you in a, an entirely different space of meaning right uh, completely and he also he also leaves words out so there is this um bit with a heart where is it um why is your heart by so much cowardice swayed so that's my version of the translation um nel cuore alette it's the this translator he leaves this out completely which is where is this um verse 98 or 120, 90 here. What is this? Why, why should you hold back? Why be a coward rather than bolder, freer? So it, um, it doesn't give you at all this idea that your, your heart is swayed yeah. I thought about by the, the easy option. Between, yeah, I thought about a difference between uh, like the spiritual Power, uh, courage and physical courage like uh, yes this translation puts you yes. in this physical courage space right only is this Raphael talking by the way because as i have my uh, share screen on here i can't see who's talking or oh, who's who was just talking now sorry oh it's oh. me it's alexander alejandro okay Okay, sorry, because as I have the screen share on here, I can't see the, uh, the participants. Oh, where are we? And also, so, uh, Rodolfo, yeah. about the, the, the Bible. Ah, okay, cool, thanks. It's interesting because um, obviously this is about a Christian journey through heaven and hell, so that that's immediately relevant to, to Dante's Inferno as well. I think that's going to be very helpful. That's something that the translator should have definitely looked up, I think. But he may not have been aware of it because the translation is, is, is not available. It's also interesting when there's words lacking in certain languages. Because it, it forbids you to think the whole category of phenomena that, that are related to this world and the nuances of experience as well. So we can now imagine that upon entering the antechamber to hell, Dante recognizes the spirit of the great refusal, which may well have been a vision of the shadow of himself that he may have overcome, that he may have become, sorry, he, so he may have, this is my own interpretation, is that perhaps by not naming the shadow in the antechamber to hell, Dante sees the possibility of himself and everybody else to, to become the shadow of themselves. To become a shadowy figure the one who he nearly didn't step up he nearly recoiled and said who am i to do this i can't do this and then and then he did but had if he hadn't there is the possibility of what he could have become so it's to me this shadow is also the spirit of the great refusal and and um, you know the possibility of the shadow of ourselves that we can become when we lack when we lack courage to to step up so the condemnation of the opportunists and conformists rings loud in Dante's antechamber to hell, but the viltad of the great refusal also touches upon a vulnerability in all of us. As Virgil remarks in the second canto, it deflects so many a valorous undertaking. So the viltad is not a vice, not enough to send you to hell. It's not exactly cowardice. It's a kind of, it's linked, it's a kind of tepidness linked to excessive humility. Who am I to? And this is, and this humility in this case reveals itself as a false, a false virtue. It isn't a virtue to be humble in a way that stops you from acting. It is the viltada that feeds the wolf. I quote the beast, the cause of your complaint. End of quote. The, for, the one that forces many an undertaking spirit back to where the sun is lost. So the torment of self. I'm moving now away from Dante to um, an author that I, I met briefly before, unfortunately, he, he came to pass um, and who wrote an article that really stayed with me for a long time and, and came back to my mind when I read 
this text by Dante. The torment of self-doubt that befalls Dante before his journey brings to mind the searing words of Mark Fisher in his article, Good for Nothing. It's an article that he wrote in 2014. But what Fisher calls the sneering inner voice that turns us into a shirker, someone who shirks responsibility. The, this shearing voice that makes us concede our place to what Fisher calls the calm confidence of one born to the role. So this inner voice belongs, Fisher, to the internalized expression of actual so social forces. It afflicts anyone, so this end of quote, and I, I think it afflicts anyone who belongs to an oppressed group so that they will feel that they are not, and I quote here, not the kind of person who can fulfill roles which are earmarked for the dominant group, end of quote. Those who dare, even though they don't belong to this group, are then in danger, I quote, of being overcome by feelings of vertigo, panic, and horror. Very much, I think, like the description that, um, that Dante makes and Virgil of, of this heart that is seized by Viltade. And I quote here because these are quite strong words. Mark Fisher is quoting uh, a book by um, a psychiatrist called Smail, and that's called The Origins of Unhappiness. So those who are in danger of being over, who, uh, those who do dare are in danger of being overcome by feelings of vertigo, panic, and horror. They are isolated, cut off, surrounded by a hostile space, suddenly without connections, without stability, with nothing to hold you upright or in place. A dizzying, sickening unreality takes possession of you. You're threatened by a complete loss of identity, a sense of utter fraudulence, you have no right to be here now inhibiting, in, inhabiting this body dressed in this way. You are nothing and nothing is quite literally what you feel you are about to become, end of quote. So Fisher argues with Smale that there's a flip side to this structural form of depression, which is, is, is the one that perpetuates and reproduces power relations. And this flip side is a form of magical voluntarism. I quote, it's the belief that it is within every individual's power to make themselves whatever they want to be, end of quote. This magical voluntarism is a pillar of the contemporary capitalist society that Mark Fisher criticizes. And for us, it's telling seen from this angle that Dante cannot overcome his self-doubt without the intervention of Virgil and Beatrice. And let us not forget that Dante, the historical figure, embarks on the writing of the Divine Comedy with the trepidation of one who is expropriated and exiled and who's about to quite literally tell the most powerful men of his time to go to hell. If Dante's seminal phrase, the great refusal, flies in the face of the Marcusean rallying cry for principled opposition to injustice, it's the opposite of it practically, then we must not overlook the fact that the existence of the divine comedy is testament to the Marcusean spirit. Because in writing hell, Dante performs a refusal of the great refusal. And so it's the purpose of the next section now to dig further into this speculative dimension of the double negation. I just want to say a couple of things about what I mean with the speculative that was in the introduction here. How are we with timekeeping, by the way? Because I think we should have a little break as well. If we, what do we started at two, right? Um, yes, we started an hour ago. We could, since the session is two and a half hours long, um, we could yeah, keep I going. think we should have like two, two five minute breaks, two, five to 10 minutes breaks. Is that okay? okay. Like every, every um what is that then every, every 45 minutes um usually yeah usually we do like one 10 minute break but if you want to do two five minutes that could be okay yeah i think it's nice because it's long to concentrate especially this time i mean the other sessions will probably have uh, a less kind of reading out text situation but 
it might be nice. So I would say a couple of words about the um, speculative dimension of aesthetics, and then that, that's going to be a good natural break before we move on uh, to Alfred North Whitehead, where it gets a little bit more abstract and, and complicated. So the idea of a speculative aesthetics is here used in the habitual sense of something that is risky, uncertain, projecting itself onto uncharted territory, but also in the philosophical sense where the, where the speculative flouts the limitations of what Kant calls the natural use of reason, that is, reason confined to dealing with objects that are accessible to experience. And I would just kind of underline, because we're going to talk about Whitehead, to what exists in actuality. So we're going to be talking with the speculative about what is possible rather than what exists in actuality. So the speculative belongs to a tradition without tradition that addresses, as Marcuse said, if not our lives, then our, and I quote, our capacity to function as unmutilated, unmutilated humans. End of quote. So the stress in this, seminar on the, on the great refusal lies on a realm of experience and value and aesthetics unmutilated of its possibilities. Its substance no longer lies only in the refusal of oppression and of the one dimensionality of life under capitalism, but also in laying claim to negativity, to that which is not as productive of an aesthetic dimension of the possible. So yeah, I think we should have a little five minute break and, and come back refreshed with a tea or coffee or something like this. And then we'll start the, the section on, on Whitehead. Is that okay? Let me just see if I can, how do I change this so I see you all again? Ah, here we go. Okay. So see you, uh, what's that? It's uh, three. 303 where I am, three past, um, maybe a 10 past, is that okay? Sounds good. Okay.
Hey, you are back. Okay, cool. Okay, nice one. Should we go? Should we continue? Any more people are back? Okay. So now to the speculative aesthetics of the great refusal with Alfred North Whitehead. Now I haven't, I'm not a specialist of Whitehead and I've kind of discovered his work really through this idea of the great refusal, but I think he's a really extraordinary thinker who hasn't been categorized very easily either on the analytical side of the Anglo-Saxon analytical side, where he's kind of often in a kind of theological crowd, if, if that's, I don't know, Gregory, perhaps you know more about this than, than I do, but I, it seems to me that um, his philosophy is often appropriated by certain um, groups of readers as, as if it was fully representative of a certain orientation of thought, when I think that the spectrum, spectrum of thought of which he's capable is really quite massive and extraordinary. And he's a, a strange philosopher, a little bit like, I think also Schelling in the 19th century, because he talks about religion and God in a way that can be misleading if you don't read the fine print. It's not, it's not a very obvious kind of religious philosophy, I don't think. Or rather, maybe I shouldn't even say this at all because I don't read him like a religious philosopher. I'm not. Uh, I, I'm not coming to this with a theological angle. Not really. Anyway, it's not my. It's not my building site. So in his book *Science and the Modern World*, we find Whitehead's expression, "the great refusal," which Herbert Marcuse will then later use in *Eros and Civilization*. Marcuse interprets Whitehead through a Freudian lens. So the refusal would be the refusal to accept the separation from the libidinous object or subject. And for Marcuse, this refusal is aligned, for example, with the Surrealists and with André Breton's Surrealist conviction, I quote, that the imagination alone accounts for what can be, end of quote. So with, um, with Marcuse, the imagination becomes something like a firewall against the repressive dominion of reason. So the imagination would be uncompromised by, I quote, the actual organization of facts, end of quote. And it's when Marcuse makes, it's the moment when he makes this argument uh, in favor for the imagination and its emancipation from reason that he quotes Whitehead. And I, I quickly read here the quote, Marcuse's own quote, which I, if I'm not mistaken, is on the page 150 of the PDF that I sent you. And this quote goes as such, that this is Marcuse quoting Whitehead, namely the truth that some propositions respecting an actual occasion the truth that some proposition respecting an actual occasion is untrue may express the vital truth as to the aesthetic achievement. It expresses the great refusal, which is its primary characteristic. And I've got this here on the PowerPoint. So I'll share that with you. Okay. The truth, no, that's the wrong one. Should be a short one somewhere here. Yeah, the truth that some proposition respecting an actual occasion is untrue may express the vital truth as to the aesthetic achievement 
it expresses the great refusal, which is its primary characteristic. So if you're confused, that's okay, because I found this totally confusing. And this is not even the whole story, because while we read it, we might as well read, read in context the quote that Marcus is referring to. And it's completely okay to be confused by this because it's, it's a really out there text. So I'll read that for you, wait. And I think at the end of the, at the, end of the seminar, this is not going to sound as esoterical and strange anymore as it might at first reading. And if it's not strange to you, then, you know, bravo and amazing to be with you because I found this very strange. This is what uh, Whitehead says in, in his book, and there's the bit inside that Marcus is quoting from. Apart from the actual occurrence of the same eternal objects in other occasions. So he's talking about universals, but he doesn't want to say universals because he doesn't agree with Aristotle's systems of classifications. So we're not using, we're saying eternal objects instead of saying universals. Apart from the actual occurrence of the same eternal objects in other occasions. Every actual occasion is set within a realm of alternative interconnected entities. This realm is disclosed by all the untrue propositions which can be predicated significantly of that occasion. It is the realm of alternative suggestions whose foothold in actuality transcends each actual occasion. The real relevance of untrue propositions for each actual occasion is disclosed by art, romance, and by criticism in reference to ideals. It is the foundation of, metaphysical, of the metaphysical position which I am maintaining that the understanding of actuality requires a reference to ideality. The two realms are intrinsically inherent in the total metaphysical situation. The truth that some proposition respecting an actual occasion is untrue may express the vital truth as to the aesthetic achievement. It expresses the great refusal, which is its primary characteristic. An event is decisive in proportion to the importance for it of its untrue propositions. So I put the comma in there by mistake. So an event is decisive in proportion to the importance for it of its untrue propositions. Their relevance to the event cannot be dissociated from what the event is in itself by way of achievement. So I'm not expecting, unless you are ardent whitehead readers and this all falls into place straight away, if like me, this is your entry point to whitehead and I'm expecting you to be at least as confused as I was. Is, how are you finding this, by the way? Am I projecting onto so, your? Do you find this text obvious? I or? would like. I would. I was thinking before the class that, that uh, of actually thanking you of of uh, putting this in the, in the the syllabus because Whitehead was was someone that I that I wanted to to read for a while, but I got to actually read him, and like I guess uh, when it gets really complicated, it is really complicated and it's really difficult, but reading the entire book, I found him perfectly clear. Like, it, it sure, it sure uh, needs some baggage, like, but I, I was thinking about thanking you because it, 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 this book is making me feel that I'm starting to, to understand this, the, the things I was grasping this, this last two years, you know? And, and also the, the, your, your article on pure information on Simon Don. I, I, I'm starting to see the, uh, really see the connection. I think. Oh wow! I hadn't I had actually totally forgotten about that one. I I don't know. There is probably well, yeah, some, I, I, you know, there must be because you know it's always the same passion that drives us. It's got to be connected. But is and yeah. But what? So you were working for two years. What was your kind of? Did you have? No, a, like I I know I don't work in anything like that. I, but it's been. Last, yeah, I'm, I'm basically a musician, but. This is uh, like I, I, I'm finishing a, a, an undergrad in international relations, but 
So like, I, I, but yeah, this is like a personal project. I think. Yeah, yeah, good. But that's that's exactly the kind of things that I want to know because there's I don't think there's much point in reading, you know, either Marcuse or or Whitehead or even Dante if it if it isn't a way that we can thread into contemporary practices. So that's the object of the seminar to do that. Yeah. But I think yeah. and then I'll continue now with, if, uh, if nobody tells me, okay, you're the only one who was confused, then I think I'm, I'm okay, we can continue with this. I, much remains to be said of the urgency to recover Marcuse's emancipatory aesthetics, but our focus here will be limited on Whitehead's speculative defense of the imagination. This will allow us to insist with Whitehead on the implications fleetingly mentioned by Marcuse in Eros and Civilization, where Marcuse says, I quote, the progressive ideas of rationalism can be recaptured, but only when they're reformulated. So I'm quoting this here. This is, I think, on page 72 of the PDF that I sent you. I, I'm quoting this here because it, um, it sounds often like we have a um, confrontation between the imagination and reason. And in the, in the worst case scenario, this would be a philosopher Marcuse arguing against reason, which would make absolutely no sense. So there, there are these concessions here that, yeah, reason is okay, but you'd really have to reformat the whole thing. And this is exactly what Whitehead is doing, of course. Whitehead will allow us to foreground a complex and nuanced function of negativity. So the refusal in the sense of negativity or, or the untrue propositions but one that sits uneasily with the moral connotation of Marcuse's critique of what he calls the negativity of reason. So negativity, we're gonna find with, with Whitehead, negativity is good. <laughs> I think it's the, the rebel in me that thinks, yeah, it can be bad, it can be negative, it's a good thing. In his 1922 Lowell lectures, which later got published as Science and the Modern World, Whitehead indeed revives the fortunes of this phrase, the great refusal, which first entered the literary canon through Dante Alighieri's Divine Comedy. However, Whitehead uses the expression in an opposite way, and in two opposite ways, by the way. He uses it first in one way and then in the opposite, in the opposite sense. First designating a form of denial that gives rise to indignation, like with Dante. So that's the denial that, that we don't want, is the, the tepidness and the, and the viltade of the denial. Uh, of, yeah, I said denial, I wanted to get to that, of refusal as denial, as a, a denial of, of a possibility, denial of what can be, and the kind of cowardliness with which we stick to a safe, what seems to be a safe position. So Whitehead uses the expression in opposite ways, first designating a form of denial that gives rise to indignation, to the viltade of the great refusal, and later in a completely contrary sense, where the great refusal is affirmative of a vital truth. So these two uses of refusal, refusal and if you like refusal of the refusal, but he doesn't put it, he doesn't put it like this Whitehead, you just come suddenly across the idea of refusal in, in, a, in an opposite sense and you're like, okay. Um, so this, um, where was I? Whitehead uses the expression opposite ways, suggesting a, the double negation of a refusal of the great refusal, even though he doesn't put it like that. However, we want to avoid the trap of a double negation if we think that this would issue in a simple affirmation. So for example, if the viltad of the great refusal in Dante would be that which refuses a possibility. Refusing the refusal would be like a simple affirmation of the possibility. It's, it's a really, is a vice of reason to do double negations. You should, you should never do that, but it's happening here. So we have, we've got to deal with this. And we're going to make it a little bit more complicated, even because although there is something like a refusal of the refusal or a negation of negation happening here, we're gonna see with Whitehead why this doesn't lead to a simple affirmation. Okay, we'll try to avoid the trap of a double negation as issuing in a simple affirmation, which would discourage us from understanding the role that Whitehead reserves for negativity in his metaphysics. In Whitehead's metaphysics, the second refusal, in fact, expresses a negativity 
that is both necessary and significant. It is negativity that gives actions their full importance as situated in a halo of alternatives. So closer inspection will reveal a fault line running through negation itself, through ty different types of negation, rather than opposing negation to affirmation. And another fault line running through reason itself, dividing the imaginative use of reason from intolerant abstractions, rather than opposing reason to the imagination. So we're kind of sh shifting, shaking things around, shifting that a little bit, making it a little bit less obvious. So there's on the one hand, I, in my reading at least, but you can also disagree with me at the end, obviously when we've gone through this, a fault line dividing two different understandings of negation rather than opposing simply negation to affirmation. And the other one, which is a fault line running through reason itself. So rather than opposing reason to the imagination as Marcuse seems to do, we'll look at reason that is uh, an imaginative use of reason and reason when it is reduced to intolerant abstractions. Let me see if I have some useful quotes here for you. Can you, you can still see my um, PowerPoint, right? Okay. In fact, you know what, before we go on, while we're at it, I'll just quickly read, read this out for you. This is from Herbert Marcuse's Eros in Civilization, the bit, uh, bits of his text that are just before the moment when he quotes the Great Refusal, because it, it might help to have that a little bit in context to then uh, distinguish. So this is his text. Yeah? According to Jung, Jung, fantasy is undistinguishably united with all other mental factors. So including reason, I presume. It, appear, it appears now as primeval, now as the ultimate and most audacious synthesis of all capabilities. Fantasy is above all the creative activity out of which flow the answers to all answerable questions. It is the mother of all possibilities in which all mental opposites, as well as the conflict between internal and external world are united. Fantasy has always built the bridge between the irreconcilable, irreconcilable demands of object and subject, extroversion and introversion. The simultaneously retrospective and expectant character of the imagination is thus clearly stated. It looks, it looks not only back to an aboriginal golden past, but also forward to all still unrealized but realizable possibilities. But already in Jung's earlier work, the emphasis is on retrospective and consequently fantastic qualities of the imagination. Dream thinking moves in a retrograde manner toward the raw material of memory. It is a regression to the original perception in the development of Jung's psychology, it is obscurantistic and reactionary trends. Its obscurantistic and reactionary trends have become predominant and have eliminated the critical insights of Freud's metapsychology. So the, other, the other bits of text are not so long. So, and also we're not working on this directly, but I think it's important to understand where Marcus is coming from when he quotes a text that makes strictly no reference to psychology at all or psychology, psychoanalysis, or the psychic functions uh, of the imagination. So this is still the, the same text from Herbert Marcuse before leading up to the bit where he quotes um, Whitehead. According to Jung, fantasy is undistinguishably united with all other, no, sorry, we had that, ah, ha, ha, because what I did, I, I um, broke it up into, into better sections just before the talk now and, so we've just read this. Oh, 
Okay, this is the end of the one we just read. So he kind of departs from Jung and he thinks you have to run with the imagination and, and with the importance that Jung gives it, but you have to do it with the apparatus of, of Freud's, Freud's psychoanalysis. And then he says, the truth value of imagination relates not only to the past, but also to the future. The forms of freedom and happiness with which it invokes claim to deliver the historical reality. So in its refusal, so the imagination, in its refusal to accept as final the limitations imposed upon freedom and happiness by the reality principle. It's, it's a refusal to a certain extent of the reality principle. In its refusal to forget what can be lies the critical function of fantasy. And he quotes here um, André Breton, the surrealist, réduire l'imagination à l'esclavage, combien même il y a de ceux qu'on appelle grossièrement le bonheur, c'est se dérober à tout ce qu'on trouve au fond de soi de justice suprême. La seule imagination me rend compte de ce qui peut être. I didn't realize that was in French, sorry. Uh, let me see if he translated this. The surrealists recognize the revolutionary implications of Freud's discoveries. Imagination is perhaps about to reclaim its rights, says, says Freud here, I guess, or, or André Breton, I'm not entirely sure. But when they asked the surrealists, cannot the dream also be applied to the solution of the fundamental problems of life? They went beyond psychoanalysis in demanding that the dream be made into reality without compromising its content. Art allied itself with the revolution. And this is, this is where we come to the great refusal. Uncompromising adherence to the strict value of imagination comprehends reality more fully that the propositions of the artistic imagination are untrue in terms of the actual organization of facts belongs to the essence of their truth. So before we reread, I think because it's, it's worth reading this Whitehead quote many times to, to let it sink in. Um, but in rereading this, I, I also just realized to what other extent I think he's misreading Whitehead or there's a possible misreading that we can avoid, which is the reality principle. Because, because when Whitehead talks about possibilities, he talks about possibilities as real. So there is um, two ways of looking at this. There's a re reality principle, I guess, that is um, that would correspond to what Whitehead calls uh, intolerant abstractions, a, rea a reductive reality that is imposed as something that you have to um, conform to. Whereas for Whitehead, on the other hand, he's got this incredibly wild metaphysics where well, not wild, to be honest, because the, the realm of abstract or the realm of eternal objects and the realm of possibilities are, um, are not contrary to reason. And they're not contrary to reality either. Uh, but we'll get to that. So here's again and the quote. So this, this was coming at it through Marcuse. If you want, we can go back to the French bit that I, I just glossed over it. I didn't realize it. It's also strange that he didn't put a translation in it himself. Here again, Whitehead, the truth that some propositions respecting an actual occasion is untrue, may express the vital truth as to the aesthetic achievement. It expresses the great refusal, which is its primary characteristic. So here it's obviously, I think, to be um, relating to the surrealist refusal of a reality principle that would restrict what you can express. Yeah, I guess the, the, the aesthetic concept is different. Yeah, to, to Whitehead into Marcuse, but it's the picture. Yeah, it, 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 that's so interesting because it is about aesthetics for Whitehead too. There is an affinity, but I think the consequences of wording it differently are quite significant and shouldn't be swept under the carpet because it seems that um, if you probed Marcuse and asked him, so are you advocating for, for the imagination against reason? 
and there's a chance he might say yes, but more likely he would say, no, we want to reform the reason. We want a reason that is capable of integrating the imagination. But it does sound an awful lot like with the surrealists, for instance, a revolution of the imagination would come through a, through a refusal of what seems to be a reason and the reality principle on the other side. Whereas for Whitehead, it's a refusal of a, um, of a castrated reason, it's a refusal of a reductive understanding of reason. And so what happens in the realm of the possible isn't something that is contrary to reason. I think that's quite important. I think it will be hopefully at the end of the seminar much more accessible. So let me just see, we have seen this already. I'll leave this up to distract you a little bit. <laughs> no, actually we shouldn't. You know what, we'll, I'll take the screen share off. And you'll just get me. How do I make this big? Okay. So, the removal of perplexity. That's my take on the great refusal that would be the, the one in, in Whitehead that echoes the great refusal in Dante and in the antechamber to hell. For Dante, the great, by the way, with the time, timing, we still keep an eye on that, yeah? So we can have another little break mm -hmm. in, later in, in, at four or whatever. Cecile? Yeah? Do you know how many more sections you have um, planned for today? I mean, I'm going to take it as uh, as long as it um, as we go. I think some of the sections we're going to deal with probably in the next seminar. But so we'll just do another okay. what now we've, we've like until until ten two, and then I think uh, we'll stop and and continue a bit with the introductions or with discussing the ideas we've had. So probably more discussing the ideas we've gone through today, and at the same time mixing in some introductions if yes. we have time. Is that and then, good? Yes, and then going over uh, the presentation stuff yeah exactly okay. perhaps we should do that first so we don't run out of time yes yes good okay so just remind me so the, the removal of perplexity that would be kind of my heading for the first understanding of the great refusal in whitehead and then we'll see later how how you think marcus's take fits with that for Dante, the great refusal designated the failure to live up to an event, a failure that comes at the cost of becoming shadows of ourselves. Whitehead's first revival of Dante's indignation, the one that leads Dante to place the one who committed the great refusal in the antechamber of hell, could seems to me at odds with Marcuse. Whitehead here directs the sting of Dante's moral condemnation beyond the lack of individual virtue at the broad scope of metaphysics. Because the great refusal here refers first of all to an intellectual cowardice or intellectual viltade, a small mindedness, a way of, of um, seeking summary answers. And I quote Whitehead here. This is on page 194, if you, if you have the PDF with you. Oh, do you know what? Actually, I could put this up for you. Mm. No, it's going to take too long. Is that okay? Would you, would you rather have it up on the PowerPoint to read it at the same time as I read it to you? Or if I read it slowly, is that is that okay? Yes, no, maybe. I'll, if it would really help to have it up, I'll just quickly paste it onto the, on the PowerPoint. Okay. So let me just put this up there. Okay. 
chat. So here we go. That's the quote from Whitehead. What is the status of the enduring stability of, of the order of nature? What is the status of the enduring stability of the order of nature? There is the summary answer, which refers nature to some greater reality standing behind it. This reality occurs in the history of thought under many names, the absolute Brahma, the order of heaven or God. My point is that any summary conclusion, jumping to the easy assumption that there is an ultimate reality, which in some unexplained way is to be appealed to for the removal of complexity, constitutes the great refusal of rationality to assert its rights. So if it's okay with you, we'll read it maybe once or twice more, just so that it, it kind of sinks in and you can pass out the ideas. So behind this question is the one that, why does anything at all in the universe have stability? How come that it, how can we explain that things endure? Obviously things change also, but things change also on the backdrop of realities that endure and in the context of which we can then interpret change. In, in a way, it's like making that strange again. What is the status of the enduring stability of the order of nature? There is a summary answer which refers nature to some greater reality standing behind it. This reality occurs in the history of thought under the names of the absolute, Brahma, the order of heaven or God. But my point is that any summary conclusion, jumping to the easy assumption that there's an ultimate reality which in some unexplained way is to be appealed to for the removal of complexity. This constitutes the great refusal of rationality to assert its rights. So straight away here, I think you have a, a very a seemingly incompatible and perhaps indeed incompatible. Can I ask um, you something yeah, very quick? Go ahead. Go ahead. It's okay. just that because both times you read complexity instead of perplexity. So, <laughs> Did I? I'm really yeah, sorry. just wondering <laughs> which one is the. Perplexity is the right one. The removal of perplexity. Okay, thank you. Sorry. I'm so sorry about this. Is to be appealed to for the removal of perplexity. It's also the title of, of this section. I mean, they are related, obviously, because you are perplexed because something is complex. And the attempt to make it more simple than it is, to create shortcuts of thought, to appeal to something that uh, is like a dogmatic truth because it ultimately is unexplainable. And you say, okay, because it's un unexplainable, you know, we'll use an idea like God for it. So in that sense, also earlier I was saying that if Whitehead is sometimes absorbed by theology, that's a big job because he's also clearly not referring to anything that we are used to thinking of when, when we think of, of theology. So certainly if he thinks about God in one of the chapters in his book, when you read that chapter, you quickly realize that it's very hard to reconcile this with ordinary theological accounts of of divine existence or God. So here the first, the, the great refusal is, is an avoidance of perplexity. You don't want to be perplexed by what you can't explain. And therefore you just have a dogmatic reflex and you say, well, this is the answer for it. Then I can't explain all of it, but clearly that's what it's gotta be. And, um, The great refusal of rationality to assert its rights. So rationality to assert its rights in this context would first of all mean to be able to dwell with perplexity. It doesn't mean that you can explain everything rationally. It means that if you can't explain it yet, it's the right of rationality to, to stay with this perplexity and to ward off any form of dogmatic overreach and, and quick answer or shortcut to it. So that's different in two ways from Marcuse. The first way, obviously, because you had, is the opposite. You had first an idea that, that the imagination refuses the overreach of reason. And here it's almost saying, okay, it's the imagination that comes up. He doesn't say it like this, but in a way it's, an, 
it's an imaginary solution, God, or well, I don't want to offend anyone's religion, but in, in this sense, to propose a solution to perplexity that is based on the imagination rather than reason, because reason hasn't finished its job and it needs to stay with perplexity in order to, to be able to project itself onto a possible rational explanation of the phenomena that it, that it encounters. It's kind of, it's contrary to Marcus, I think in two ways, both in the relation to the imagination and obviously in the sense that we're talking here about the refusal as something that's negative. That's negative in the sense of uh, uh, worthy of the disapproval of the philosopher. Whereas Marcuse was using the, the refusal as something that's um, positive, and that also corresponds to the way that Mar that uh, Marcuse will use the great refusal later. It doesn't correspond hundred percent, but we'll come to that in a sec. So it is not only, however, the mystical evaporations of reason that Whitehead subsumes under this refusal to grant reason its full rights. His critique encompasses in equal measure the intolerant use of abstraction in modern science, which confines knowledge, I quote, to a certain type of facts abstracted from the complete circumstances in which they occur. So the, the intolerant use of abstraction in modern science, which is likewise a way of you know, putting the reins on reason by confining knowledge only to a certain type of facts, such that they are, that scientific knowledge is abstracted from the complete circumstances in which these facts occur. This is on, on page 18. So what we've come to understand or what we've come to call modern science is then not unlike theological dogmatism, a way of doubling down on ultimate ideas of refusing to entertain alternatives, rational alternatives, to, I quote, the fixed scientific cosmology, which in the case of, of uh, modern science presupposes, I quote, the ultimate fact of an irreducible brute matter or material spread throughout space in a flux of configurations. I'll read that again. So refusing to entertain alternatives, I quote, to, to the fixed scientific cosmology, which presupposes the ultimate fact as an irreducible brute matter or material spread throughout space in a flux of configurations. So he's really taking, um, uh, taking a swing at materialism here. And he's taking a swing at materialism, not from um, some kind of purely poetic justice move, because he will quote also the romantics later, but from the point of view of someone who was involved with the kind of, he was a mathematician who was really present and involved at the, in one of the biggest paradigm shifts of physics from classical physics to um, quantum physics and um, from classical geometry to um, non-classical geometry. So he, there is something happening in reason, opening up a realm for reason, that was to which materialism would seem like a straight jacket. So he's not against reason, he's not against science, he's just saying that something happened in the course of 300 years of modern science that is similar and comparable to dogmatism, that is a way of, of a refusal of perplexity, refusal to dwell with a problem you can't explain yet until you find truly rational explanations rather than having an overreach of principles that seem reasonable enough to explain what you already know, but that you only assume will explain other things. I just need to switch that off. Okay, okay. So he's taking a swing at materialism here as well, at, the, at this idea of um, matter as something that is spread out throughout space in a flux of configurations. And mostly, I don't know if there's any ardent Adorno readers amongst you. Is there? I can't see you right now. A little bit, a little bit. I think, I think it'd be really interesting to read 
Marcus alongside uh, Adorno, because what really bothers him the most, I think, with 300 years of um, modern science and with the way that it curtails the most speculative end of reason is its insistence on actuality, on that, that which exists is only what is there in actuality and that can be experienced in actuality. So for Whitehead, his kind of rationalism means that the, beyond the, the immediate actuality of a physical event, there is a whole realm of abstraction that is not just a way of thinking about the event, but that belongs by right to the event itself. It's a little bit difficult to wrap your head around this, I think, but, um, but that's a very audacious, proposition to make, and I think he makes it rather well, actually. So here we have this first instance of the great refusal in Whitehead that represents a kind of obstinacy. And so it's not really rationality, but it's, it's a kind of pseudo rationality that becomes an obstinacy and that hollows reason out so that that stops some of its possibilities from realizing itself. And it does so with abstractions that forego the more subtle employment of our senses. So that's, that's what, what he wants is rationality, not to break off and then say, we don't know how to explain, we know how to explain um, the astrophysics of a sunset, but we can't explain its beauty. And he says, reason should also, should not suddenly stop and not be able to understand the aesthetic experience. Go ahead, Eduardo. Um, uh, hi, I, I was wondering if, um... I agree with what you said about uh, the use of reason by science, but maybe this is sort of changing now. I don't know. I feel like physics has a lot of speculative fields. I'm not particularly uh, knowledgeable about it, but I feel that with the popularity of quantum physics, maybe we're approaching a moment that even popular science can become uh, speculative again. Yeah, I, I hope so. And I it seems to me that if you like, um, you could say that Whitehead on, on has high, he sides with a kind of avant-garde of physics against the reactionaries of physics or of, of science more, more generally. So it's, it's never a question of for or against science or for or against reason. It's what end of the spectrum of reason you situ situate yourself on with respect to the possibility of what reason can engage with. So I think that spectrum in a way is, is a moving spectrum. So if we have um, come now to integrate many of the um, theories in physics that were still debated and rejected by some uh, at the time of Whitehead's writing, this spectrum moves because as you have, as you have a kind of new field of accept, accepted theories, whatever is speculative is still a kind of fringe activity of reason. So it would be interesting to, speculate or imagine what his position would be with respect to contemporary theories, but not being a scientist or I think in a mathematician or physicist, that's a bit difficult for me to project myself in any greater detail there. So what have we got here? Yeah, so the, um, one of the reasons why this happened in modern science, this kind of um, encrusting of postulates that become dogmas is because of the methodological success of the, of the modern sciences. And I, I quote him here, but it's a short quote, so I don't think I need to put it up necessarily. Whitehead says, the success of these ultimate ideas confirmed scientists in their refusal to modify them as a result of an inquiry into their rationality. Every philosophy, so this is for example, with respect to materialism, every philosophy was bound in some way or other to swallow them whole. But thought is abstract and the intolerant use of abstractions is the major vice of the intellect. So from this quote, you can already um, anticipate that the refusal in the positive sense that will be developed later is to do with abstractions. So what, what, does reason, what is reason allowed to do with abstractions? How far can it go? 
So it is not only the sensitivity of the poet that is offended by the intolerant abstraction of modern science, but also that of the mathematician and logician that Whitehead is, who stands at the cusp of the paradigmatic recasting of classical geometry and physics, contributing to the effort to imagine and construct the as yet unforeseeable consequences of the eruption of non-classical mechanics, quantum physics, and relativity. You could say, to use the expression coined by Pascal, Pascal was a 17th century philosopher, French philosopher, that, and a, a very famous mathematician as well, that the intellectual and aesthetic cowardice of the great refusal, as it was described here, offends both this, the esprit fin and the esprit géomètre. So that for Pascal, he thought that, the, that you had kind of two different types of the mind. The esprit fin is the one that uses the imagination that is good at rhetorics. And the esprit géomètre is the, is the analytical mind that is not perhaps not so good at, at synthesizing things or seeing things aesthetically, but, but that can analyze things and make kind of truth claims. But he, Pascal felt that these two aspects of, um, of the mind belonged to one another and, and that um, one cannot function adequately without the other. So in that sense, I was thinking that you could use the expression of Pascal to say that the intellectual and aesthetic cowardice of the great refusal offends both the esprit fin and the esprit géomètre, not as two separate spheres of the intellect, but in the more profound and implicit interrelatedness that emerges fully only in acts of intellectual audacity. So even empiricism, in its emancipation from an overwrought scholastic rationalism. So if you like, the um, beginning of modern science was a way of freeing reason from scholastic philosophy, which, had, which appeared to have kind of created this um, house of cards of abstract ideas that you could always add, you know, that became very labyrinthine and very abstract. And, and it wasn't immediately, not only it wasn't immediately obvious anymore how you could come back to, um, observations in, in concrete experience, but also you couldn't be sure anymore if you could follow this thread of reason back to statements that are actually verifiable. But even empiricism, although it emancipated itself from this form of overwrought rationalism by medieval scholastic philosophy, still risked falling into what Whitehead calls an unimaginative empiricism. The kind, and I quote, that of all people in the world, Newton fell into. And Newton fell into this unimaginative in empiricism and, and when he dismissed the wave theory of light. So Huygens' wave theory of light uh, was dismissed because um, Newton preferred to side instead with the corpuscular theory of light because it fit more readily with the observation of rectilinear linear rays that characterize the shadows cast by obstructing objects. So in, in a way you could almost say that it's an, it's an short falling of the imagination. It's because you have things that have proven themselves useful in experience um, that reason is curtailed. It made sense rationally to embrace Huygens' a wave theory of light, but empiricism kind of just held on to the steadfastness of, of its experiences instead. So the refusal of both rationalism and empiricism consists in putting an arbitrary stop to inquisitive reason. And no more, nowhere more blatantly, it seems, than in the paradoxes attended upon the reductive materialism of Stuart Mill. Stuart Mill, who inadvertently puts reason in a straitjacket of mechanical necessity. And actually this one, I'll, I'll put that up quickly for you on the PowerPoint. Just a second. Mm 
Okay. One of the reasons why I think this is an important quote is that it's quite relevant also to kind of naturalism and reductive neurocognitive theories today that also rely similarly on a kind of mechanistic explanation of thought and cognition. So Stuart Mill inadvertently, I think, puts reason in a straitjacket of mechanical necessity. And I quote, it is obvious that Mill's doctrine affords no escape from the dilemma presented by thoroughgoing mechanism. So all mechanistic explanations of nature, likewise for Whitehead, the ones that are prevalent also today, would, would fall under the same form of dogmatism or refusal to grant reason its rights. It's obvious that Mill's doctrine affords no escape from the dilemma presented by thoroughgoing mechanism. Mill's doctrine is generally accepted, especially among scientists, as though in some way it allowed you to accept the extreme doctrine of materialistic mechanism. And yet, mitigating, and yet mitigated its unbelievable consequences. So sorry, I read that wrong. As though in some way it allowed you to accept the extreme doctrine of materialistic mechanism and yet mitigated its unbelievable consequences. It does nothing of the sort. Either molecules, molecules run blindly or they do not. If they run blindly, the mental states are irrelevant in discussing bodily actions. So I think a similar dilemma would still apply today when you try to give mechanistic uh, neurocognitive accounts of what cognition is. And you know, the, the massive claims have been made, for example, about the, that freedom does not exist and that we are completely predetermined by our neuronal syn synapses. So the refusal haunting Whitehead's lectures with the spirit of Dante's contempt for the great refusal, thus first refers to those who fail to persist in the face of perplexity. Those who would rather abdicate reason by ring fencing ultimate ideas such as materialism or mechanism, or by falling back onto a vacuous appeal to incommensur incommensurability. The great refusal is here the failure to assert the rights of reason in its tussle with perplexity. Scientific reason thereby earns its place in Dante Chambers, Dante's antechamber to hell, which we can then define with Whitehead as the efficient, this is his words, the efficient, dull and half-hearted age of the professional man of the last decades, decades of the 19th century. And I quote, the clear-sighted men of the sort who are so clearly wrong. This is on page 103 of the, of the PDF I gave you. Their fault then, end of quote, their fault then is not a sin properly speaking. It is the denial of complexity and, and the avoidance of perplexity. So we're not, not wanting to remain perplexed. It consists in the failure to entertain a possibility because it may seem foolish in light of established facts. Oblivious though, and this is what uh, Whitehead underlines, oblivious of the historical evidence that shows, as Whitehead insists, I quote, that almost all really new ideas have a certain aspect of foolishness when they are first produced, end of quote. So any dogmatic appeal to an ultimate principle, be it matter or be it the appeal to established facts, merely serves the removal of perplexity. We could say that, to re recall the words of, of Virgil, it offends the self-respect of intellect. And, and Whitehead calls this a self-respect of intellect to pursue every tangle of thought to its final unravelment. So this is a great refusal that kind of puts an arbitrary stop. The great refusal is thus a failure of nerve that stops reason from intuiting the most radical consequences of rational and poetic intuition. It is the poet in the mathematician who experiences moral repulsion at intolerant abstraction because it leaves out, I quote, everything that is most important to the poetic rendering of concrete experience, end of quote. That's from the page nine. So there is, this is where Whitehead then 
performs a volt a kind of sudden turning around, because now he's going to invest the notion of the great refusal with an ethos that is completely contrary to the one that we've so far exposed. And that's going to bring us closer to Marcuse while also revealing, I think, quite a fundamental difference and incompatibility to a certain extent with Marcuse. So at stake from now on with the next uh, type of refusal is no longer reason's accommodation with established facts or so-called established facts, but I quote an intuitive refusal seriously to accept the abstract materialism of science, end of quote. So now I'm coming to the next section, which is negativity in its own right, or the refusal of the great refusal, the second refusal. How are we with time? Should we have another five minute break then? And, and uh, the next section is, is quite long. So we have half an hour left, right, for this session. Um, yeah, we have 25 minutes, um, though we can go a little bit over time. Um, so I guess like 30 minutes. Um, you think you have enough time for talking about the presentations and questions with that time? Yeah, I think then we should perhaps take a little bit less, like four minutes or so, just enough to grab a cup of coffee or, or tea and um, take a deep breath. I don't know if you, I, I find this material quite dense and I guess being read to in an online situation is, is not ideal as well. And also the next sessions are not going to be like this. In the next sessions, we're going to basically stay with this material and unpack it. Um, um, yeah, so, sorry, Nima, you wanted to say something? Quickly. Yeah, I just wanted to ask that if it's possible to share this text that you're reading from. Like, yeah, 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 absolutely. This text. Yeah, it can be I'm, helpful for me at least to just review the, the today's I know, seminar. I know, I know. This text, I am uh, in the middle, it's it's submitted for publication, so I'm, I kind of can't really share it just now as it is, um, but I'm going to cut together all the different quotes um, and maybe share it as a PowerPoint so that it, it make a better PowerPoint than the one I've done just now. I was, I was a bit reticent to make a PowerPoint, so I didn't do a very good one. Thank uh, you. I'll make a better one for next time. So shall we have a little break, little cup of tea and something? We'll be back maybe in, yeah, 10, 10 or 12 past. And then we do, we talk about the presentations and continue to introduce ourselves a little bit more. And, or, may, or maybe depending, either continue the introductions or, or discuss some of the ideas so that they kind of, make more sense. Yeah. We'll see you in a couple of minutes then. Twelve past. At twelve past, yeah. Four minutes I think is good.
think everyone needed a big a bigger break. Okay, we're back on. Yeah, so I think we'll leave the negativity in its own right for, for the next session. <clears throat> Shall we get the thing with the presentations out of the way first so we don't run out of time and then have to do it in the, in the last minute? But, yes. Um, is Nad Nadia is there? I can't see you. Oh, yeah, no, that sounds good. Oh, yeah, sorry, you're there. Okay. Good, so you tell me how, how this works. Um, yes, let me, should have been more prepared. Um, so I created a Google sign up, which I will act, I'll share it in the chat and then also I'll send through email. Um, but basically anybody who is a, um, someone who's not audited in class and who's using this for a certificate should sign up for at least one presentation. Um, and it should be two people per presentation, two to three um probably two um for 15 minute presentation uh so wait but if it's two then we would need eight sessions to have everyone give a presentation no because that 22 or something yeah so you can, on the sign up sheet it will show you if like you could sign up to present in class or it could be outside of class but just let cecile or i know um what your choice is if you want to do it in class or outside of class um and I'll share the Google Doc. I'm trying to find it. Um, but yeah, yeah. Basically, I think I think it'd be really nice to do it in class if okay. it's possible, because it, in that case we would probably have to have like I don't know, is that three, three times seven is twenty one. That that nearly does it. Yeah, three to four presentations is quite quite a lot. Is it to have them in class, or am I calculating this wrong? How yes. many? How many did you say are there? How many people are so in, in, total in the class? Sorry, how many people are in, in total in the class? 22, right? Or, or were there more people signed up that also need to do presentations? So. 22 for today, but there's like at least 32 all, all together. Oh, and all 32 have to give a presentation? Oops, you disappeared. I can't hear you anymore. No Does anybody else know from the other courses how it worked? Does like every, everybody normally give a, a 10 minute presentation or? I mean, you could do it in groups and they can be, I've been in classes where it was four people working together to do a presentation. That makes more sense because I was just gonna say, if it's a 10 minute presentation for 32 people, that's, that's gonna be a long, Long, a lot of the, the seminar used up by that basically okay but then in that case it really makes sense to finish the introductions because it'd be nice to uh for each of you because i don't know i guess you're not really meeting outside of this or you don't necessarily know each other outside of this so if you know what other people's interests are it'll be easier to team up and do something together right I mean, some of us have gotten to know each other through the randomness of picking a session to present at, which has been really fun. So, but yeah, I agree. Then the rest of the introductions are good too. So if, uh, if Nadia is kind of cut out right now, perhaps she's got problems with, um, with internet connections and she knows the logistics of, of really what the new center expects for the presentation. Since this is the first time I'm doing it, I'm, you know, I can't really, tell you more than she would. So shall we continue with the introductions a little or would you rather we discuss a little bit the ideas and metabolize what happened and then continue with the introductions next time? And what's the first feeling? I say introductions. Well, nobody, nobody is like really desperate to, <laughs> to discuss the great refusal just now. I'm sure we're gonna have loads of discussions, but 
let's continue the introduction. I'm actually really curious who you guys are and what, what you do. This already earlier what we discussed is so interesting. I volunteer myself. Uh, uh, yeah, like I met several people already. Uh, this is gonna be repetitive, right? But it's normal. But yeah, like I, I'm still finishing uh, under graduation. I, uh, I got a little bit confused because here in Portuguese, in Brazil, at least we, we call graduação, what you what in this, the states you guys call you guys call under graduation. I think there's some something in there. So, but I'm still finishing my 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 bachelor's. I think that's the, that's most probably right. And my bachelor's degree in international relations. And uh, so I I try to 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 delve a little bit deep into political economy and mainly this side of of the that's like international relations international relations can be a lot of things right and I do yeah I I try to 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 study Marx and you know you know what political economy involves right and and as I said before I I try to uh, I have this kind of personal project uh, I try to to read I don't know yeah uh, German the idealism in general did you read mostly um Hegel or also a bit of Schelling and Fichte and stuff yeah so like I I I, I actually don't don't read any of the three like I just I'm, I'm still uh, starting to engage really with the 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 main ones right with the the difficult ones I mainly through this with uh, by by means of uh, commentators and in a little yeah, bit yeah. of 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 reading, yeah. But okay. yeah, like yeah, and and and, and Wittgenstein too, and and, and like yeah, and, 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 and all the the, the Marxist side. Okay. Right? Okay. And, great. And, and just yeah. So yeah, I, I'm I'm really happy to. Okay. Cool. The, the, okay. the seminar has been has been perfect for for me. And uh, and the. The order of people the way you were earlier is kind of jumbled up, so I don't know who's who's next. Um, Alexandra, maybe? Rodolfo, you already introduced yourself. Yeah, for you, you did already. Alexandra, do you want to say something? Um, hello, nice to meet you. My name is Alexandra. I'm architect and urban planner uh, from Crimea. And now, actually, I'm trying to um, go a bit away from architecture and make some uh, cross-disciplinary researches so i'm looking for <laughs> some um some new topics in philosophy and science okay lovely thanks and now uh, carlos okay hey uh, okay, so I'm Brazilian and actually living in the Netherlands right now because of a PhD. I'm a musician and sound artist. So I'm, I'm not really embroiled into the whole uh, new center program. I'm just taking this uh, seminar because my subject is actually the poetics of negativity in sound-based artistic practices. Nice. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really into basically everything that you, you have prepared for us, but... Uh, I'm still struggling with a few issues regarding mainly the excessively dialectical nature of it sometimes, like affirmation, negation. Because uh, kind of, I don't know if it makes sense to uh, uh, approach it through what I'm trying to develop in the artistic realm, which is a kind of figure out a, a way to embed poetically in the works a sort of negativity that prevents it from being appropriated and alienated by the same system from which uh, you wanted to distance yourself, yourself from. So I'm, I'm trying to understand how to do that in a more practical way. In a sense, of course, there is a philosophical uh, background that comes with it, yeah. but uh, through sound, which is also very abstract. Yeah, and and very concrete, both abstract and concrete. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we've just I've just had a very intense week with uh, Martin. I don't know if you if you know his work. He's a kind of experimental musician and philosopher who just published a book called Social Dissonance, mm -hmm. and he had a three day uh, residence in a 
place called Cafe Otto. They do experimental music in London. And so it, it, it was uh, a very much about the place of negativity also. And if I sound dialectical, then probably in the sense that I, that's what I want to avoid. I don't want to have the kind of, it, 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 actually that was my mistake at first. I thought, okay, there's a refusal and then there's the opposite of the refusal. So surely it must be a kind of negation of the negation. So what is it that we're affirming here? And then as I went through and, and really discovered Whitehead in this kind of closer reading, I, I discovered a whole new way of thinking of the complexity of the actual and the virtual and the and what is positive yeah, what, yeah. aff what is affirmed as truth or untruth and how this participates in in the situation as events it's it's yeah, really I, not I, I don't mean to say that you're being dialectical i'm saying that my struggle at the moment is precisely that because i see that uh, it's not really one just exists in comparison to the other so which, which is why i'm really interested in the negativity on itself yeah, but this is, I think this is a really fundamental question because it's yeah. not, it's, it's something that a few, but not many philosophers have clearly stated that they felt they needed to find an alternative way of, of thinking about flux and change to a kind of Hegelian dialectic, which was also very dominant in France at a certain time. And, and so I think Whitehead probably belongs to that. Also, he's hilarious because he said that when he read, he's a, a logician, he, he, when he read the Hegel's logic, he said it made absolutely no sense to him. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, so con to be continued, um, I think uh, Nima, you introduced yourself already. Benito, if you want to say a couple of words? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, so I'm Benito. I live in Naples, Italy. Uh, but I studied in uh, Rome, Italy. Um, I studied philosophy, I have a bachelor. Um, and uh, I'm interested mostly in uh, the intersection between aesthetics and politics. Um, so I've been greatly inspired by uh, the, uh, the point of view, like from Deleuze and Guattari, but also from uh, aesthetic theory, I guess it's called in English by Adorno. Um, and I'm also greatly interested in uh, mostly in filmmaking and in cinema, in the cinematic uh, um, way of, uh, of expression. Uh, yeah, of express. great. So you heard, uh, right? You saw the, the little clip that I got, uh, Christine Sin, who agreed to do one of the sessions with us. And she's a, a filmmaker and director and producer. And um, Oh, great. No, yeah. I didn't say Okay, yeah, no, but this is a bit of a, I, I got her to agree when we had already set up the seminar, so I kind of mentioned it quickly. She's a really uh, extraordinary, in my mind, extraordinary filmmaker. She did The Act of Killing together with Joshua Oppenheimer. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Oscar nominated and um, she's, that, 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 that film was like really out of this world. So I, yeah. I think that in... In terms of what we're going to be discussing here, which is uh, this, I loved our early discussion about Viltade and this kind of tepidness, and which is much more interesting take on it than than really cowardice. And it, ah, you're going to see. Hopefully, we're going to be able to uh, screen the film as well. Use one of the sessions to screen the film and then discuss it. But yeah, that's that's the idea. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, me too. Like mad, actually. I'm I'm so happy that she said yes. So. Um, Eduarda Camargo. Uh, hi, um, I am Eduarda. I'm based in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, right now I'm doing a master's on uh, memes uh, and I'm trying to make like a sort of systematic and aesthetic based approach to memes and um, try to bring them uh, close to Abby Warburg, to some of conceptions of Warburg along with Susan Blackmore. And um, my interest in this seminar was because I feel like I have like this interest in negativity like, uh, since the How Foster chapter, The Return of the Real on the book <laughs> of the same title and how he treats abjection and trauma and all these concepts. And then 
later to some things found in, that I read on Lacan, and then I've uh, I've had the alienation seminar with Martin, and uh, ended up making a presentation on the mental state of noise, and okay. I was very fascinated on the, the whole book discussion. So. Um, I'm very interested in the question of the negative capability of heat and how you use it. Uh, it, it made me really curious to, to get a more uh, in-depth look of that. Yeah, I'm still trying to work. I know that I'm kind of, I'm, it's always the thing, same thing that drives me, but I, for example, the negative capability, now that you mention it, is, is really something that I need to explore in, in this in the connection with the great refusal in, in this it, it is obviously related but it's yeah work to be done it's a building site nice yeah we i think i mean it's it's only eight sessions so perhaps we won't be able to do it but the return of the real would be actually a really good text if you wanted to do a presentation on that that would be amazing for example that would be really good um okay nice um i think what did we have? Sorry, I, I always get confused with pep papers and letters and stuff. Where's the other one? I wrote down. Um, yeah, no, because Benito, you just appeared at the at the other end of the configuration, but you already presented yourself, right? So Alexandra, maybe do you want to and, and tell me if I'm skipping anyone or I, because I don't know in what order. Do you see people in the same order as I do? Probably not. Anyway, Alex, Alexandra already said hello, so you you kind of just jumbled it now for me. Uh, Rachel, Clipper. Do you, you want me to present again, Cecile? Alexandra, no, ah, no, sorry, oh, yes, this, no, yeah, no, 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 not sorry. at all, I, 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 I need your help, yeah. because for some reason, something happened that all, maybe someone switched their window off and came back on, and the whole order of people kind of changed, so I was going one after the other uh, visu visually, and I'm trying to okay. understand from my I, I, illegible handwriting who had already presented and trying to match the faces with the names. Yeah, so even, I think my hand too mistake mistook you. No, I, I, I talked with my ah, and that so. probably changed the order of the of the windows. You know that maybe oh, you to, the, to the, first the, windows. Oh, okay. <laughs> and then if people switch their wind their, their faces off, obviously I, I can't really match the names completely yet. So who who hasn't presented? Uh, Greg Gregory, you presented yourself right at the beginning or not? I can't remember. Yes, we did, didn't you? Um. Mm -hmm. Yeah, give me a hand, guys. <laughs> so I'm just going to confuse did, you, did, you yeah. all. Yeah. You did, yeah. Angkor? But, uh, Angkor too, yeah. Angkor too? You did? Think... You're here. You're here on my list. That's right. I, I've, um, yeah. I really must do something about my handwriting because it's like scribbled all over the place. So, yeah, you have... There's only three more people, right? No, two more people, because Nadia already introduced herself as well. Or is there people who aren't visible on my field? I think well, there's three people, but yeah, there's one. Yeah. Nadia is um, I don't know, is it Xuan Ha? Yeah, hello. Uh, um, so um, I'm Ha, I'm Ma independent artist and an art organizer based in Da Nang, Vietnam. And um, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I am interested in uh, working with a community and also for my personal work, I work with a cultural value that I danger of being lost in the context of globalization, um, as well as uh, being aware of the, the central danger of living, of living in a capitalist country, but under the label of communism. Uh, so what for I feel and um, uh, because uh, working individually and also working with the community at the same time, sometimes make me have many uh, personal um, reflection 
um, the, the, the conflict of uh, approval and also refusal at the same time in many events. So I'm just thinking to try the seminar to, um, uh, to go deeper um, into those thoughts. Nice. So actually, yeah, background of mine is not um, something, I do not working with the philosophy that I want to learn more. Yeah. Okay, yeah, amazing. Yeah, I think it's, an, it's interesting when you work with communities, how this, the level of approval, for instance, I think, for example, Mark Fisher, when he described this in his text, this sense of uh, what your status is in a community and how that enables you to be brave or not and what is required um, for you to be able to make a stand that you're not entitled to make normally or to speak up as a person who's not a designated speaker, for instance, or who's not from whom you don't expect something and what kind of inner turmoil is associated with these kind of structural questions of who is, who is allowed to speak and, and who's not expected to, to be an agent. And never mind the question of whether what you say is going to be consensual or not you know then on top of it obviously if you say something that is that ruffles feathers or that is upsetting there's a lot of risk taking i guess involved in in that as well as on the on the other hand we have a lot of um, positive talk around communities as as what would be the kind of saving grace of capitalism of if you could if only you could extract yourself from this hoovering universality of that that flattens all values and you could come back to a kind of community-based life with values I and mean, I, personally I, I always worry that people underestimate the sinister side of this I mean it, it doesn't have to be sinister but I, I think there is an aspect of what Mark Fisher described is it works also and especially in very small communities or or, or not I don't know Cecile yeah when nearly I think when nearly there there's one one more person okay right Oh, is it? And there's definitely yeah. it's all jumping around. Uh, can you hear me? Hi, Maria. Yes. Hey. Hi. Um, yeah. So, just I'll try to make it kind of quick. Uh, my name is Maria. Maria Jesus Mauri. Um, though I think Mauri has a French pronunciation, which I don't know how to uh, pronounce it. Um, and I am a, have a bachelor's degree in music composition. I am from Peru. Um, and my main interest, I would say now, is uh, resonance as a foundation for relation, which is something I have kind of like um, recently uh, been able to put into words because I have always had this fascination with resonance, but in the sense of community, uh, of community and, and uh, also transformation for some reason, I'll try to make sense of that during um, more conversations. And I, I'm really excited to be here. I'm really excited about uh, this, uh, all of this uh, seminar and the themes it proposes. And I don't have that much to say that was uh, a lot actually already. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thanks. No, and I, I had a question uh, about the last session because the the title kind of uh, interests me interests me, but I think it's more like a closing session session because it's like revisiting the perplexities of refusal. But I was um, interested by home things, and I don't know if you could like explain a little bit what would be because in that would for me, uh, be really interesting to talk about in terms, uh, I'm talking about specifically about the presentation. So I, I've signed myself to the sixth session, but I don't know if the session, the eighth and last session has any like um, thematic presentation beyond revisiting uh, what we have saw or read or whatever. Yeah, the, this haunting, it refers to two things. Hopefully, 
to the discussions that we will have about um, the act of killing if we manage to get it screened and potentially that's going to be our session with uh, Christine Sin, but it also refers to an expression that Whitehead has when he says the realm of eternal objects. It sounds strange if I say it like this, but once we get through the text, I think it'll make more sense. So that would be the realm of, of possibility, of um, haunts the actual. So it, ha it haunts our experience of the event. Okay, so I definitely will go there because I have my thesis was about vaporwave, but it dealt with uh, a niche genre, but it dealt a lot with the same stuff of memory of, of archives, you told memory digital archives. And it also revisited uh, Mark Fisher's work on hauntology and all this about lost futures and stuff. So yeah, I'm, I definitely am very interested in that. So I just wanted to clear that up. So thanks, Cecile. Yeah, that's a good um, that's a good point actually because I I had I kind of in my mind I left that session open and I thought I was going to think of it as like the haunting of all the previous things that we talked about, but also looking at at this notion of the the realm of possibility at what haunts the actual. Um, but it, that's another good suggestion actually that we could read something else from Mark Fisher if, if we get to it. So as we evolve through it and through our conversations, I, I, if we can, I will pull in different texts and maybe leave aside others that look less relevant. But they are, thank you. So there's one, I think one more person. Have I left anyone out? No, it's uh, Nguyen. Is that the right way to pronounce your name? Um, it's it's Nguyen, but that's, that's not um, my given name. Um, in Vietnamese, family name goes first, and then middle name, and then given name. I thought I thought that earlier also with uh, Xuan Ha, but I I didn't know because some people then inverse it for kind of a, a yeah. Western tradition, so that people don't keep up mixing their names. Also, yeah. I don't know which one is your first yeah, that, name and which one is your last. So it's your uh, first name is my given name is No N G O C, and you pronounce that. No, no, okay. And so, Xuanha so is your first name. Is that your first name or la your last name? That I'm really sorry to be ignorant like this, but yeah, you call me right name. And you, actually, you can copy ha ha, so it's easier. Huh? Yeah, it doesn't have to be easy. I'm, I like difficult, but I, I just want to get it right and not kind of get stuck with the wrong way of, of saying it. And, and also, I have to apologize to everyone. There's practically zero chance um, that I will call people by the right name because I don't do, even do that with my children. <laughs> I call people right by random names. I don't know. I think it was at some point I had this, some kind of oversaturation from reading in my brain. So there's some random function that happens in social interactions, which I just get names and faces. I keep mixing them up. So I apologize in advance, but yeah. well, okay. personally, that's okay. Well, to me personally, that's okay. And so it's a it's, to say anyway. Yeah, because I just wanted to get the pronunciation right. It's no, because it's not it's, obvious from the way that it's spelled. It's not. not. The, the NG is, it's a difficult sound to make. So it's, that's okay. Uh, um, but anyways, uh, hello, my name is uh, Nop. I'm also from Vietnam. Um, I guess I don't fully understand why I'm here. Um, I mean, with the new center, it was kind of like a compulsive position to sign up and then I just got carried away, I guess in a good way. Um, I, my background, I actually, I actually have a, a bachelor in um, finance um, and I turned around and, and did a master in, um, education, um, but politically oriented education. Um, so um, inevitably, I guess that would lead me to philosophy. Um, and I was looking around for a program and sort of saw um, the posting by the new center and I looked it up and I was like, oh, there's no bureaucracy. At least there's not much bureaucracy with this institution. So. I signed up um, and uh, I guess for this class, the idea of, of negation, I feel like it, it's, it, 
it's always the more responsible choice to talk about something by making, I guess, in this, in this linguistic context, you call it untrue propositions. Um, that's, to me, that's the, the responsible way of, of going about things or the more responsible, responsible way. Um, I guess my, um, I, I guess my interest or goal is to sort of find um, affirmations um, to, to kind of um, ground myself in my, in my practice. Because my, my research um, goes into the direction um, with queer theory and, and gender and sexuality. And so querying in itself for me is a, is a practice, I guess, querying could be seen as a, as a way to negate um, dominant discourses. Um, and then the second refusal. Um, um, it was exciting to, 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 I guess, listen to whatever was being presented. Um, yeah, that's that. I'm really, yeah, I'm glad you say that because it's, it obviously, to me, it makes me also really happy if I find that the um, topic in and of itself has kind of different avenue, avenues that you can travel with it. But I can, I can see how this would relate. And if you have suggestions for texts that you think even abstract, short extracts of text, just shoot away, send, send me stuff. Or if we can, we'll, we'll kind of integrate it and bring it in. So I know I've kind of exceeded the... Uh, instructions here for this two and a half hour session and, and did I wanted to do the introduction it's really important for me to know I, even if even it, just to have it in the back of my mind that these are the different dimensions of possibility that you can take the, the problems that philosophical problems that we're going to be discussing aesthetics and so forth um, the next sessions are not going to be heavy reading like that I don't think that's a nice way of, of working together but I, I also wanted to make sure that I you know I do what's asked of me and I still have the last section which is relatively short that kind of turns the question of refusal around in in Whitehead and then we're going to just um, do close readings of the texts that are involved here um, imbricate if we can abstracts of texts um, like Hal Foster for example or uh, the ontology Mark Fisher you know and try and and try and discuss these together and always keep them close to your practice if that's possible because i think that's um much more interesting than having some kind of content that then stays there and we don't know what it does do you guys know what you need to do with it with the presentations i'm gonna um email them with clear uh directions uh to later today okay. oh, thank we you just, very much uh, i was yeah. going to ask just that yeah. Good, because earlier um, when you cut out quickly, I think someone said that uh, because there's relatively many people, depending on how many of, of you will actually do presentations, for everyone to do a 10 minute presentation would be a bit long. So it could be nice if you, um, from these introductions, you find um, people that you want to link up with and yes, maybe do a presentation together. That would be really good. Cecile, I, I don't know if you, if you take, took a look at the spreadsheet that that uh, isn't, but it's like it's one presentation per session that as i understood yes is, is that right um yes with, with the way the readings are right now um that's how it is i do have to cut the, se the session um because you went a little bit too over time but i we can i mean i can respond to people through email um i, I can put my email in the chat okay just just one last question if it's one one session per person then you would have to and it's another seven sessions and 30 people to go that would be a bit that would be a lot of people having to work together right yes but uh, do you ha do you have more than one reading per session or is it just one reading per session? that's what i have it up right now as one reading per session one reading mean one student reading no um like there can be there's more than one presenter for the reading and like there's like someone who presents them someone who like responds to whatever they're um, presenting and yeah, my, my question is though, do you have more than one like text per session that people should read? Oh, okay. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what you mean because I mean, we'll be working. I think we're, we're working through this. So we, we're going to kind of carry this bag of texts with us and then and draw from them when they become relevant. Do you, 
I think there's, I think probably you need to explain this. If you want to, you can close this uh, session now and then explain to me um, exactly how your presentations and responding thing works. And then we can write to everyone and give them clear instruction, instructions. Shall we do that? Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. Okie dokie. Right. So, so uh, our confusion will be cleared up. Yeah. yeah. Just a really quick thing, just uh, 